First, we'll lay the two game boards side by side. We'll play the short scenario, which lasts until August 18th. I generally use the optional weather rules for longer scenarios, but for our playthrough purposes, we'll go with the historical weather, as the days will have clear skies through the entire scenario, which means we'll have German raids every phase. We place the phase marker on the 7 a.m. box, the weather marker on August 13th on the clear side, and the combat round marker on the 1 box. The player controls two British aircraft. To determine which two, we place all of the pilot markers in a cup and randomly select them. The first two pilots will be our active pilots. Our first draw is Waters, a hurricane pilot, who will fly our number one aircraft. Our second draw is Clisby, a Spitfire pilot, who will fly our number two aircraft. We draw two more pilots for our reserve. Holmwood, a hurricane pilot, is the first, while Stone, another Spitfire pilot, is the next. The short scenario ends on Sunday the 18th. As noted in the calendar space, we're able to draw one more pilot and place him in the box as a further reserve. And we draw Drake, another hurricane pilot. In the longer scenarios, we would continue drawing pilot counters for every remaining Sunday. Next, we place fatigue markers in the rested spaces for both of our pilots. Fatigue increases when pilots fly missions, but decreases during the night phase when they are allowed to rest. We place the British DSO marker on the zero box in the pilot victories column. This column will be used to track the aircraft kills of our British pilots. Now we'll place the RAF victory markers in the total player victories track, and we do the same for the RAF losses marker, which is used to track the number of RAF units destroyed. The top row is the ones track, and the bottom row is the tens track. Next, we'll place our RAF base location which will need to be one of the five sector airfields on the map. For our game, we'll choose Hornchurch as our main base. Now that we've chosen our base, we'll place our two British aircraft on the same space. Pilot Waters is a hurricane pilot and will be flying the number one aircraft, while Pilot Clisby will be flying a Spitfire in the number two aircraft. We place our ammo markers on the ammo counter track British fighters have a total of 15 seconds of ammunition, the equivalent of five bursts, as noted by the ammo blocks on the track. All ammo is replenished fully between missions. We also place the altitude marker in the airfield box on the altitude display, which shows the aircraft dispersed on the airfield and the pilots at readiness. Next, we'll place the German air unit counters in a container which will then be randomly chosen when a raid is activated. As stated earlier, not all of the 25 German air units will be in play at the start. The counters with the blue ID markers will be removed at the start, as these units are reinforcements that are added later, according to specific dates on the calendar. That leaves us with 19 German counters to begin our scenario. Finally, we place the London's burning marker and the damaged radar marker on the zero boxes of their respective tracks. And we place all of the raid chits into a container. We begin the 7 a.m. phase. Our two British aircraft are stationed at Hornchurch. We can either fly a patrol over a valid British target, which will incur a fatigue penalty, or we may move to an undamaged satellite airfield and await a German raid with no loss of fatigue. We'll move our aircraft to Rochford for the time being, 
closer to where the action will be, but in a position to scramble if the Germans decide to skirt the coast and head to targets further inland. We randomly draw a raid ship from the container, and the Germans begin the day with a large raid made up of six raiders. First, we roll a d6 die to determine where the raid appears, and we roll a two. We place the raid marker on the two space. Next, we roll two dice to determine the reported altitude of the raid. And a roll of seven places the raid at 15,000 feet. We randomly draw six German counters face down and place them on the row marked 15,000 feet. The German raid is in a position to move further inland or make a sharper turn north to hit targets along the coast. We'll give the Germans another move before we decide to scramble. For now, the RAF will stand by at Roachford. With the RAF sitting out this impulse, control switches back to the Germans. We roll a die to determine which direction the raid will move next. And a roll of one shows the raid continuing to head west and is now near Rye Radar Station. It could decide to bomb the radar site on the next impulse, but there is a decent chance it could skirt the target and continue inland. The RAF will take the chance the raid will bypass Rye and decide to scramble both pilots. The pilot fatigue markers are shifted up and the altitude markers are moved to ground level. As you can see, it costs the RAF an entire movement phase just to get off the ground. Control now switches back to the Germans as we roll to see which direction the raid will take. And a roll of three sends the raid to Rye Radar Station. As the raid is now over a valid, undamaged target, the hidden German counters are now revealed. The raid is revealed and contains three fighters and three bombers. We now roll two dice and refer to the actual altitude of the raiders. And a roll of five indicates that there is no change in altitude. We now resolve the bomb damage. The bombers in this raid are made up of two HE-111s and one DO-17. The 111s cause two bomb damage points apiece, while the DO-17 causes one. There is a light AA icon in the hex, but the raid is flying too high, over 10,000 feet, to cause any disruption to the bomb. Adding up all bomb icons results in a total of five. Normally, five hits would be applied to the target, but radar sites are special cases. Historically, it was more difficult to knock out a radar site due to the open construction of the radar towers. Therefore, radar sites only take half damage with any fractions rounded up. So, half of five is two and a half. Rounding up the fraction gives us a total of three hits. Our first radar site has been damaged, so we move the chain home damage marker up one space, indicating that until the radar is repaired, we'll have to wait one full movement impulse before we are able to respond to future German raids. Now that the German raid has dropped its bombs, it begins its return to France. We roll a die to determine which direction the raid will move. But the RAF are out of time. Racing along at ground level, even with their movement value of four, they will be out of range to intercept the Germans before they make it back to France. We roll a four for the final German movement impulse, and the Germans make their escape. The British return to Hornchurch and await the next raid. We begin the 10 a.m. phase, and this time the British will be in the air, patrolling at Angels 20 over the satellite airfield at Limp. We shift the fatigue marker up one space 
and placed the altitude markers for both aircraft on the Angels 20 box. We draw the remix counter. So we'll place all the raid counters back into the container and randomly draw another chip. And the Germans are back again with five Raiders. We roll a dice for their location and we roll two dice for the reported altitude, which is 10,000 feet. With Rye radar station knocked out, the Germans are allowed a free movement impulse before the RAF can react. We roll a die for the raid direction, and a roll of two sends the raid directly in the path of the waiting RAF fighters. We have a couple of attack options here. The British fighters have a movement value of four, or four hexes. We could fly around the formation and attack from out of the sun, as shown by the display here. However, our flight is currently at Angels 20, or 20,000 feet. The reported altitude of the raid is 10,000 feet. If a raid is attacked by the British at two levels above or higher, then the attack is nullified as it is assumed the raid was never spotted at such extreme distances. You must be at least one level above or below the revealed altitude of the raid to attack it. There is a chance that the Germans will have escort fighters flying one level above the reported 10,000 foot level when the raid is revealed, but there is no guarantee that will happen. A second option is a head-on attack. As you can see on the board, the British are facing the German raid, so we are in a prime position for such an attack. When attacking head-on, both the attacker and target fire only one burst to simulate the snapshots taken from aircraft flying towards each other at nearly 500 miles per hour. However, any hits are applied to the pilot and engine area only. That's just fine against the Germans as any engine hits mean there's a chance the aircraft won't make it back to France. But it's riskier for the RAF, as their pilot pool is limited. A killed British pilot is removed permanently, but a wounded pilot could be just as critical, as his wounds may be serious enough to keep him out of the fight for a long time. The head-on attack is the riskier move, since the Germans would be able to take a snapshot at the RAF. So we'll fly around the raid and attack from out of the sun. Since we don't know if the Germans will be flying top cover, both RAF pilots will drop to 15,000 feet, both for mutual protection in case there is top cover, or if not, then they'll have the opportunity to surprise the raid with an effective out of the sun attack. Unlike climbing, diving in the same hex is a free move. There is no movement penalty by doing so so we'll be able to move the maximum four spaces. The RAF intercept the raid, and it's made up of three bombers and two fighters. We roll for the actual altitude of the raid, and a roll of six brings all even-numbered fighters up one level to 15,000 feet. Both 109s are even numbers, so both are moved, negating the RAF's out-of-the-sun attack. The RAF decide to fight it out with the escorts. Clisby in the Spitfire will go after one of the 109s, while Waters Hurricane will go after the other. Note that the Hurricane has a slight performance disadvantage against the 109, but it is more rugged and can take more hits than the Spitfire. We'll resolve the Hurricane attack first. We roll for the performance check, and both fighters roll a 3. The final result is 8 for the Hurricane and 9 for the 109. The Hurricane did not pass the check and therefore cannot fire. We roll for the Spitfire attack next, and it goes much better for Clisby. The roll of 6 results in a final total of 12, while the 109's roll of 3 results in a 9. Clisby can fire up to 3 bursts, the maximum allowed, but will only fire 2. Clisby gets in position and fires at the 109 and scores three out of four hits. 
The 109 pilot is wounded and the engine and frame are hit. The fighter is shot full of holes but is not destroyed. With the RAF phase complete, the Germans take their turn. The damaged 109 has a wounded pilot and a damaged engine and must break off combat. With a damaged engine, the 109 will lose one altitude level per hex entered. There are three levels, so the 109 is allowed to move three spaces before crashing. One movement point is used when exiting the map, so the damaged 109 just barely makes it back to a crash landing on a French beach. Since the 109 was able to make it off the board, Clisby gets no credit for the kill. The damaged 109 is placed back into the Luftwaffe mix container. The second 109 chooses which RAF fighter he will attack. On a roll of 1, 2, or 3, he will target the number 1 aircraft, and on a roll of 4, 5, and 6, he will target the number 2 aircraft. A roll of one means the 109 will go after Waters Hurricane. However, Clisby's Spitfire is no longer engaged in combat. Because of this, the Hurricane will add a plus one to its performance check due to the unengaged Spitfire. We roll for the performance checks, and the 109 gains the upper hand. The 109 finishes with a 12, while the Hurricane only managed to score a nine even with the plus one performance boost. The 109 will fire the maximum three bursts at the Hurricane. And it could have been worse. Only three hits are scored out of a possible six. Waters is wounded and the engine and frame also take a hit. The first round of combat has ended, so we roll to see if it will continue. A roll of five moves the combat to round two. Waters is wounded and his engine damaged, so he must immediately pancake. He will land at the satellite field at Hawking, which is out of the path of the German raid. His fate will be discovered later. Clisby and his 109 foe are evenly matched. With one RAF pilot already wounded, it is risky to chance another dogfight round, but Clisby will take the chance and maneuvers against the 109. We roll for performance checks, and it's a stalemate. Both fighters roll fours, which gives both fighters a final score of 10. So Clisby is not able to get into a firing position. Now the Germans take their turn and roll for their performance check. And the 109 manages to get an edge against the Spitfire. The 109 result is a 12, while the Spitfire gets 11. The 109 is allowed one burst against the Spitfire. And it's an accurate shot as two hits are scored. As feared, Clisby is wounded in the burst and the frame takes a hit. We roll for the next combat round and a three moves the combat to the third round. Clisby is wounded, so he immediately breaks off and joins Waters at Hawking Airfield. With the RAF successfully taken care of, the German raid continues unimpeded. A roll of two sends the raid further into the Kent countryside. The German raid continues on, moving into the Sussex region, before making a turn north toward London. All London hexes are well defended with balloon barrages and heavy anti-aircraft batteries. The heavy AA removes one point of damage, so instead of four points of bomb damage, only three are scored. The London's burning damage tracker is moved up one point. Fortunately, it does not result in an increase in the size of future German raids. Job done. The German raid returns to France, and the remaining German counters are returned into the Luftwaffe mix. We must now roll for the fate of our two wounded pilots. Waters is wounded for four weeks, which essentially puts him out of the fight for the short scenario. Clisby is also out for four weeks. 
It's a harsh blow to the RAF so early in the scenario, as we must now use both of our reserve pilots to make good our pilot losses. A small consolation is the Germans did not destroy any RAF fighters outright, so they did not score any extra victory points. We begin the 2 p.m. phase. Holmwood is assigned to the Hurricane and Stone the Spitfire. Since both pilots are fresh and fully rested, we'll have them patrol over Dunkirk radar at Angels 20. Both pilots' fatigue levels are shifted up one space. But the Germans sit this one out on a no-raid chit draw. The 5 p.m. phase begins, the last of the daylight phases. Holmwood and Stone again patrol over Dunkirk radar at Angels 20, and their fatigue level shifts upward once again. And the Germans mount one last raid for the day, consisting of five bandits. We roll for the raid placement and the reported altitude, which is 10,000 feet. The Germans get a free move due to the radar damage and move into a position near Limp Airfield. The RAF are in a prime position to attack the raid head-on and from out of the sun, which will prevent the Germans from firing back. However, there is always the possibility of German escorts flying top cover, so we'll drop Stone's Spitfire down to 15,000 feet to deal with that possibility, and Holmwood's Hurricane to 10,000 feet. And we move to attack the raid from out of the sun. The raid is revealed and contains two fighters and three bombers, one a dive bomber. We roll for the true altitude, and a roll of five keeps all raiders at 10,000 feet. With all German raiders remaining at 10,000 feet, Stone's tentative head-on pass has now turned into a diving out of the sun attack. He will target the sturdier 110 fighter, while Homewood goes after the 109. Remember, all head-on attacks strike the engine and pilot only, and no performance checks are required. We'll resolve the hurricane attack first. Homewood loses a quick burst at the 109, and only manages one hit. Normally, a six would be a hit to the frame, but since this attack is head-on, all frame hits are considered engine hits. We mark off one burst for the hurricane, and resolve the Spitfire attack. We roll for performance checks, and the Spitfire rolls a three, and the 110 a four. Since Stone is attacking from out of the sun, we add plus two to the total for a final result of 11. The 110's final result is an eight. Stone could use the maximum three bursts, but will only use two. The 110's gunner cannot return fire since he was attacked from out of the sun. Stone fires his two bursts, and the results could have been better as only two hits are scored out of four. But Stone's aim is true as both hits strike the port engine, destroying it and the ME 110. We mark off two bursts for Stone and award him his first kill. The destroyed 110 is placed face down in the destroyed aircraft box. The RAF segment is complete and control switches to the Germans. The 109 has a damaged engine after Holmwood's attack, so must immediately break off and attempt to glide back to France. Unfortunately for him, the 109 can only move two spaces, one space per altitude level, before crashing since he is at Angels 10. The German fighter splashes in the water just short of the French coast. The 109 is considered destroyed since he failed to make it off the map, and Holmwood is credited with his first kill. The 109 is placed in the destroyed aircraft box. We roll for the continuation of combat, and a 6 moves the combat to the second round. With no more escorts to deal with, the RAF are free to go after the bombers at their leisure. Holmwood will target the HE-111, while Stone goes after the Stuka. 
The raid has not yet dropped its bombs, so they will use the performance ratings printed on the counters. We'll roll for the hurricane first, and Homewood barely gets into position. The hurricane performance is 6, while the Heinkel is 5. With a difference of 1, Homewood is only able to fire one burst. Fortunately, two hits are scored, but the bomber is allowed one burst at the hurricane and manages to score a hit. We'll deal with the bomber's damage first. The gunner is wounded and the frame takes a hit. We'll resolve the hit to the hurricane and fortunately the rugged fighter only takes a hit to the frame and we mark off another burst for Homewood. Now it's Stone's turn. We roll for performance and it goes much better for the RAF this time. The final results are 10 for the Spitfire and 3 for the Stuka. Stone will only fire two bursts at the dive bomb. And his aim is true as both bursts strike home. The Stuka gunner loses a short burst at the Spitfire and he also scores a hit. We'll resolve the Stuka's damage first. And Stone's bursts destroy the engine and wound the pilot and gunner. Powerless dive bomber crashes into the ground, and another German plane is added to the destroyed box. We mark off two more bursts for stone and chalk up another kill. Now we must resolve the hit to the Spitfire. And mercifully, the burst only strikes the frame. We roll for the next combat round, and a five moves the combat to round three. Homewood will continue his attack against the Heinkel, while Stone, though low on ammo, will go after the DO-17. We roll for the Hurricane's performance check, and the RAF manage a marginally better check this time. The final totals are 9 for the Hurricane and 7 for the bomber. However, both aircraft have taken hits to their frames, so we remove one point from each roll, which results in an 8 for Homewood and six for the Heinkel. Homewood will still be able to fire off two bursts with the added benefit of facing no return fire due to the Heinkel's wounded gunner. Homewood fires away, manages to score three out of four hits, but the bursts are unable to deliver the killing blow as the gunner is killed and the pilot wounded. We mark off two more bursts for Homewood. Now it's Stone's turn, and we roll for performance. And it's more than enough. The final results are 11 for the Spitfire and 3 for the Dornier. Even removing one performance point due to the Spitfire's frame damage still gives Stone more than enough advantage. He only has one burst left, and he looses it at the bomb, but only manages one hit. The Dornier gunner fires a short burst at the Spitfire and misses on a roll of six. Stone's hit strikes the frame, but hits nothing vital. Now the Germans take their turn. The Heinkel has a wounded pilot and must immediately break off. The bomber makes it back to France and the marker is placed back into the Luftwaffe mix. We roll for another combat round and a four moves the combat to its final round. Stone is out of ammo and must immediately break off and land, which he does so at Hornchurch. Holmwood still has a single burst left, but decides enough damage has been done today, both to himself and the German raid, and he also lands at Hornchurch. The remainder of the German raid continues on, and finally arrives over West Malling Airfield, where it causes only one point of damage. Job done, the raid flies back to France. We now move to the night phase. Both the RAF and Luftwaffe received two repair points. Repair points may be used to replace destroyed aircraft or repair bomb damage. 
These two repair points must be used every night phase and cannot be carried over. The RAF lost no aircraft today, so they will use their two repair points to bring Rye radar's damage level to one. The Germans lost three aircraft today and will use their two repair points to replace two destroyed aircraft. These aircraft must be chosen at random. You cannot choose which aircraft to replace. So we choose two German aircraft and place them back into the Luftwaffe mix. The Germans score points based on how many aircraft they shoot down and according to how many damaged hexes are on the map. Radar sites are worth one victory point. All other targets are worth two points, except for the London hexes, which are worth three victory points. All told, the Germans have a total of six victory points. The RAF score points by shooting down German aircraft. Homewood and Stone scored three kills today, so the RAF end the day with three victory points. The RAF took a beating early in the day with two pilots wounded and out of the fight. But they gave as good as they got at the end of the day, destroying several German aircraft and chopping down a German raid to a point where it only caused minor damage and coming through relatively unscathed while braving some very accurate German return fire. The RAF have no replacement pilots in the near future and will have to use every advantage from now on to keep from falling too far behind. Thanks for watching and we'll talk again soon.